have the uh, Clean Water Action Connecticut Energy Network. Uh, you can see the table over there. Um, it's, it's an advance, they use advances in smart energy practices with a special focus on policy efficiency and scaling up local installations of renewables for greater energy resilience. Abbasson Young is here, uh, a worldwide fast-growing uh, commercial real estate firm headquartered in Toronto. The Connecticut Green Bank is here. It's a great source of, of uh, information on renewables and, and uh, reliable sources and helps business institutions and homeowners get things going in that regard. And of course we have Eversource. Eversource is here. Eversource has had many, many strong programs for the last few years or maybe a few, few decades, uh, two decades it says here, on energy conservation. They're a great resource and they have many, many programs available for uh, energy conservation, both residentially, commercially, and industrially. So I'm, I'm very excited to introduce Tony Malkin. I'm sure you've all heard of the Empire State Building. Many of us have uh, even been there, and he has a great story to, to tell about uh, a huge overhaul in that building, and uh, we'll let him get started. Thank you very much. So the idea is that the idea is that it is uh, it's it, it's got to be replicable. It's got to be something which people can adopt. So the, the the thing that I will say right now, if you have notes, is you can look at the Urban Land Institute Tenant Energy Optimization Program. You can go to uh, uh, Empire State Building, or uh, I think it's uh, uh, or ESBNYC.com, go to our sustainability pages. Everything we've done. All the work we've done, either for business or funded philanthropically, uh, is not patented, it's not copyrighted, it's all freeware, and it all works. It's all replicable. So uh, if, we, if, if you don't mind, I think this will advance the... There, there. So when we got started, um, just so you know, uh, this uh, was an idea which commenced uh, in 2007. In 2007, the Clinton Climate Initiative kicked off its uh, C40 Cities program. And I wouldn't have known anything about that except we got a call from Mayor Bloomberg's office to ask if we would turn the Empire State Building green. 
so that when they were up at the top of the Hearst Tower, they could have some uh, excitement on the skyline of New York City. And, and to be fair, having just gotten control of the building in August of 2006 from uh, Leona Helmsley and her winged monkeys, <laughs> we, we, we were, we, we were in the process of getting things, uh, a, a plan to what we are going to do for the building. And by the way, the plan at that time was to be green. Um, but I said, okay, we'll do it if I get to come to the events. And while I was there, uh, what we did is I, I learned about the contribution of buildings uh, to, to, I guess you might say, carbon production in some sense. Carbon production really depends on from where your electricity comes. If you're getting hydro, you're just consuming energy. Uh, if, you're, if you're getting a nuclear, you're just consuming energy. If it's coal or if it's oil or if it's natural gas, you're certainly producing uh, 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 carbon. But I got to learn about the fact that buildings in New York City, buildings in any major city, comprise of, you know, typically over 75 to 80 percent of all energy consumed. So the good news about the urban, urbanification of cities is that the, the energy use per person uh, drops considerably. The bad news is that the uh, the, the, the cities are getting bigger, so net net they're consuming more power. This got me going on a different thought. While I was there, uh, I met a guy who worked for the Clinton Climate Initiative, and. We, we, we came upon a plan and program. Originally, it started in a much smaller way, but ultimately ended up uh, being working on the Empire State Building to make it a model of, of energy efficiency and the fact that energy efficiency retrofits could work and be economically logical. We did it all in secret for two reasons. Uh, while she was no longer running the building, uh, Mrs. Helmsley still had a veto, along with my father. They each had vetoes from anything that we did. So if I didn't let her know we were doing it, she couldn't say no. Uh, and then the other side was that, uh, it's true, and the other side was that, you know, what if we proved it didn't work? We didn't want our failure to darken the water because it would be a very prominent failure. So it was an odd thing because we didn't announce it until we were done with the program and we had signed our contracts and we were starting the work. So you can look at this program, identify opportunities, 60 plus efficiency ideas were narrowed to 17 implementable projects. We evaluated measures on a net present value basis. Everything's dollars and cents in what we did. The actual results have exceeded our expectations and more than justified the energy uh, efficiency costs with savings and cash. Um, we, 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 we integrated this uh, creating the packages, we integrated this into what we were doing. It's not an add-on, okay? In the old story, the bow on a pig. If you have a pig, you put a bow on it, you still have a pig. You have a pig with a bow, but that's not going to work. If you really want to change the pig to a greyhound or to a koala bear, you have to do a lot of work. So it's better to start with integrating what you want into the plan. And then, uh, really, the, 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 the financial model is absolutely critical. Oh, any luck, that's the wrong way, and that's the right way. Sorry, this is a little bulky. There we go. So here's the motivation behind what we did. So in this case, uh, everything we did was paid for commercially. And the Tenant Energy Optimization Program, which was the groundwork for Energy Star for Tenants, which is now in the EPA, which is actually a, an, an authorizing bill that I, uh, I, I basically wrote, and got uh, Senator Bennett to put onto the Portman Shaheen Better Buildings Initiative, which was passed in April of 2015. Passed 99 to zero in the US Senate. It's the first energy policy bill in 15 years that was passed. Why 99 to zero? Because we never would have gotten it there uh, if we'd got opened it for debate. So we went for unanimous vote. We failed once, we succeeded the second time. That was funded by charity. This was all about making money. Enhancing competitive position, you do better when you offer a, 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 a cost-justified differentiation in what you offer. Architects do better by understanding how to integrate energy efficiency. Engineers do better. You can market better. Uh, and, and I would point out, by the way, commercial buildings are a great place to do it, and town and city buildings are a great place to do it. The longer the hours of operation, 
the more energy you consume, the greater the savings. So a hospital, which operates 24-7, is, is an even better investment in energy efficiency than an office building. And an office building is better than retail, and retail is better than an apartment or an apartment building. Because it depends on the, uh, the number of hours of the energy is used, which is used and the systems involved. Taking a wild guess here. There we go. No, I'm sorry, guys. This will get better. Okay. The next thing is uh, we, we modeled it for financial results. By the way, these slides will be available to anybody who wishes them for them. Okay. So that's why I'm not going to read every single thing. But if you look at it, uh, the idea behind our work was to find a midpoint where energy savings had a good economic return. And as you can see, the economic costs, the more you save, the, the, the more the curve steepens. And, and this is work which was, you know, 2007, 2008. Uh, really led, uh, the, the program was really led by uh, Amory Levins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. We had Johnson Controls, uh, Jones Lang LaSalle, uh, uh, Dana Schneider of Jones Lang LaSalle is still my partner. Uh, uh, nine years later in the work that we do together on policy and actually in our buildings. Um, we, 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 brought, uh, we, we brought to bear, uh, really, we needed to have a financial argument because when I did disclose it to Mrs. Helmsley's representatives, it had to be a lock tight program. It had to be you know, proved that it was going to work. So the interesting thing about this, our 2008 capital budget for energy related product, uh, projects was $93 million. However, we had $106 million of capital projects that we were doing uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Empire State Building anyway. So the incremental cost for adding energy efficiency in there, we just spent a bunch of dollars differently we were going to spend anyway. That's why the importance of integrating it into the work you do. I'll give you a, a for instance. I went, when this stuff was, uh, was, was released, I did a little bit of a, of a world tour. I ended up in Paris at the, uh, at, at, the, at the Tour Montparnasse, which is the ghastly 1960s building above the Gare Montparnasse, um, uh, up over by the uh, Hotel des Invalides. And I met with the people there, and it was very funny because we did the whole meeting in French. And I got done, and I was visiting with my brother, and he said, well, do you think that they understood what you said? I said, I'm sure they uh, understood what I said. I'm not sure I said what I meant. Um, <laughs> But they came across and they said, look, we'd love to do energy efficiency, but we've got a leaky curtain wall. We have to redo the air conditioning and all the wiring in the building, the energy distribution is aluminum wires. And so uh, we need to replace those. And if we still have money left over, we'll look at energy efficiency. And my comment to them was, well, look, if you, re if you replace the leaky curtain wall, the building envelope is critical, right? So this is what we call a mass and glass building, glass and mass is so much more effective inherently in energy savings than glass, right? Because a, an insulated brick wall has an R factor, resistance to heat cold transfer about 15. <coughs> the best performing glass that you can get uh, at a reasonable price on a commercial basis is about eight, R factor eight, eight and a half. Our build, I mean, the 6,514 windows rebuilt, we rebuilt at the Empire State Building are eight and a half. If you want an eight, uh, uh, to increase from 8 to a 15 R factor on glass. You're talking about glass, which is this thick. What's that? Oh, the same glass you have, but if you have two layers of glass, you can put it in our 12. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what we did on the glass in a second, uh, which was uh, Robert Clark of Alpha, Alpha Glass and Serious Materials, and Robert, if you know the space, is the, the guru on this stuff. Um, so anyway, um, the idea was that by doing this work and integrating it, the incremental cost was only $13 million. And we projected uh, a $4 million plus annual savings, which by the way, we've done much better than that. So it's a 3.1 year payback of the incremental cost, so long as we were doing uh, the, the building envelope, because the windows were leaking, so long as we were redoing lamping in public areas, 
so long as we were redoing the HVAC system in the building. The incremental cost was very low. Oops, I'm really got a big thought. Okay. So the, 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 the program uh, initiative was, in the end, to reduce the, uh, the, the energy use by 38%. Annual savings of $4.4 million. The building is now an Energy Star uh, rating of 84. Now, anybody who knows what's happened with, uh, and if you follow this stuff closely, the EPA has come up with a new commercial building energy consumption survey. Uh, and the data from that uh, and the way they did the scoring is so messed up that they have actually held back from releasing it because basically there's no building in the United States over half a million square feet. I think there are three that get Energy Star with their new, uh, their new ratings. But they need a 75 or higher. But still the Empire State Building on, a, on, a, on an energy efficiency basis, the highest uh, Energy Star rating uh, in New York City for a, a, any building over 250,000 square feet. So, and then the, the whole idea, so again, you can look at the website, esbsustainability.com is the direct way to get to the pro project that was done. How did we do it? Well, it's interesting. Um, there's, the, the, the comment that we love to use is no, there's no silver bullet. The, it's silver buckshot. You know, you have to choose all the different components and how they interact with each other to get to your desired result. So, uh, what do we start? Uh, digital direct controls. The Empire State Building is the largest wireless network for a building energy management system in the world. Why is it wireless? Because that way you don't have to pay a union electrician. Because every time she or he touches something, it costs hundreds of dollars just to touch it. Tenant daylighting and plug load. Uh, we developed new products uh, in, in the lighting area, and again, interesting because uh, we, 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 we don't sell this stuff, we have no fee from it. But again, wireless controls, uh, and, and so all our switches in all of our buildings throughout our New York City portfolio, <coughs> and we're putting it out here in the, in the suburbs, or what we call the greater New York metropolitan area, <laughs> uh, the light switches are just stuck to the wall. The, the sensors are stuck to the ceiling. There's no wires. Why? Again, the cost savings, really important, of not having the, 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 the union electrician touch the device. All they do is put in the lights. What does it mean? Within 15 feet of the exterior wall, we have auto dimming. So on a sunny day, the lights within 15 feet of the exterior wall are dimmed or off. Motion detector and infrared detection. So if people aren't actually there, and it's infrared and motion, so you don't have that everyone's been in a bathroom, the past when the lights go off and you're waving your newspaper, or Kindle, or whatever you bring in there now to get the lights to go back on. Uh, and, 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 and those two things, however, mean that whole banks of space can be shut off without actually being controlled by the building energy management system. It actually can just be, and this is all Lutron stuff that we use, but other manufacturers make it now. Uh, it, it can all be independent. It's, it's, it, it operates on its own. Another reason that that's important, frankly, is with the sensors. Everybody talks about sensors, more and more sensors. These, these sensors, who heard about the, uh, the attack from these uh, the, 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 the Samsung refrigerators, which were utilized by someone in North Korea or something to, to launch a, uh, a, a denial of service attack? I think it was on Poland. You know, there's, there's no security when you link all these things together. You know, there's no security. So by, by making these things independent, you're only communicating with each other. They never leave the building. Uh, the, the, the variable air volume, air handling units, again, the, the, the Empire State Building is a massively tuned system. So where you are, sends a signal. By the way, thermostats are all, again, taped to the walls. That's John's controls. Why? Because that way if someone Brilliant decides to put a bank of laser printers underneath the thermostat and you can move the thermostat. Otherwise, the, the temperature treatment is for the, the, for the laser printers or whatever other piece of equipment might be there, a coffee pot. So, uh, but the, 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 the demand dictates airflow. Airflow dictates the size of the aperture in the variable air problem uh, uh, air handling unit. 
that dictates fan speed. Fan speed dictates the, the cooling tower. Cooling tower fans and the pumps which distribute the chilled water. So it's all linked. It's all automatic. And again, you get a finely tuned building. What does that mean? When the sun rises from the east, people aren't melting. When the sun is setting in the west, people aren't freezing. When the sun is to the south, the typical way of balancing a, an office build out is the most important person gets paid attention to and everybody else sweats or freezes. So it's a different way of looking at it. The windows. Uh, we had thermopane windows, uh, duopane windows. 6,514 of them. We took a 5,000 square foot space within the building. We brought in what was then serious glass. It became serious materials, and then Alvin Glass bought it from them when they went bust. And uh, we built a, a glass factory. We removed the double hung windows a floor at a time, or a side of a floor at a time at night. New windows were put in. We brought them down in the factory, split them open, washed them, put in a mylar heat reflective sheet. Uh, and, and, and light reflective sheet, resealed them with krypton argon gas in the vacuum, remanufactured them the next night, went in, we reinstalled them you know, elsewhere in the building. 96% of the original frames and glass were reused. So they never left the building. It's another thing to think about as you do this work, what can be done locally, so you're not actually driving stuff around. Waste is a terrible thing. If you build the building and tearing something down is the biggest waste of energy that there is, because it was already built. So how can you adaptively reuse? Tenant energy management systems. This is very important. Plug loads. Um, you, you, you have hot plugs and you have timed plugs. The hot plugs should be into what you need to operate 24-7, never shut off as plug. The CPU of your computer. Okay? But there's no reason your screens should be on all night. So you put those in a timed plug. I will say that I've been in my office at 8 o'clock at night when my screen is shut off and I have to go under my desk and plug it into a hot plug. Uh, but it works. It works, and it works on the weekends. Uh, the radiated barrier, uh, not just the glass, but then uh, between the radiators and the exterior of the Empire State Building was just air. Now there's insulation, so we're no longer, if you look at the heat signature of the building today versus what it was in 2007, it's blue much more blue in the winter time. And it's much more red in the summertime. That means that the exterior of the building has a major temperature difference from the in interior of the building. It's cold on the outside in the winter, it's cold on the outside, it's warm, well, hot on the outside in the summer. But you put the radiated barrier so you're not cooling the outside of the building. And then, uh, of course, the tenant GCB. When you put it all together, that was our target 38% reduction. Uh -huh. There we go. So, um, if you look at the measures that we chose, the other interesting thing is what happens inside the tenant space and what happens in the building space. So the tenant <laughs> consumes about 80%, excuse me, buildings consume 80%, tenant consumes about 50 to 55%, in some buildings 60% of the energy consumed in a building. So when we look at the New York City's 80 by 50 rule, which is seeking to penalize whole buildings, for energy performance. And I've been trying to work, a number of us are trying to work very hard with the mayor's office, with the city council, uh, which has become a difficult thing to do, to point out you need to address the building code for tenants as well. It can't just be the landlord. The landlord can't be fully obligated for what happens because the tenant controls the majority of the energy consumption. That's, that's, that's very important to understand. What are the incentives? Look at that on the right in the green there, those are all the things that take place in the tenant space. The ones on the left are the ones that take place in the building space. Well, but the, the, that brought us to another piece, and I've only got 50 more slides, so I'll speed up. <laughs> uh, that brought us to another, another, another space, which, is, uh, which was high, uh, previewed and highlighted by this energy star for tenants, which I mentioned. Right now, the thing which everybody uh, uh, is uh, most familiar with is LEED. But LEED is not about energy efficiency. LEED is a scavenger hunt for points. In fact, they had Energy Star as a requirement for LEED. The new CBEX ratings came out, and LEED came up with it. The US Green Building Council came up with a new rating that doesn't involve Energy Star. So what I wanted to do, everybody wants a cookie, a reward for what 
she or he does. So uh, we actually, that's why we, got, we went down to DC. We said, let's get Energy Star for tenants. They said, uh, the EPA, we'd love to do that, but we only do what the Department of Energy tells us to do. We went to the Department of Energy. They said, we'd love to do that, but we only do what Congress authorizes us. And I went back to North Street School in my head, a little Super 8 cartridge movie. Hi, I'm a bill, and this is how I get written and passed. And I thought to myself, literally, that was the image in my head. So, and I said to them, that means we have to have a bill. She said, yes. Uh, and that began, uh, quite honestly, it, it, it took uh, three years to get that done. But we did. We got a bill authorizing Energy Star for tenants. We are one of 45 at our headquarters and a couple of other locations uh, in our building, but J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Jones Lang and Sal, Christopher Wakefield, others. Um, 45 charter Energy Star for tenants certificates. So we actually have it awarded. They, they, they took in about 250 applications. They awarded just over 40, and they're going to make this a regular routine. They're going to look at how it actually worked, but it's going to be a regular routine. You'll be able to get an Energy Star cookie, plaque, certificate for your office space. And we think that that's good, because everybody wants a reward, right? I'll go quickly through here. Uh, I didn't mean to go that quickly. So, uh, a couple of examples. Um, again, you can look at this, but the key thing that I'd point out to uh, Cody, 160,000 square feet, saving 6,300,000 kilowatt hours over the lease term. In their build-out, it cost them another $1.62 a square foot to build out their space, to put energy efficiency measures in there for a total of just under 260,000. Energy savings over the lease term, a million one hundred thousand dollars. So you've got your ROI of 182%, your annual rate of return of 24%, your payback period of four years, in this case is a 15-year lease. It works, makes money. That's how we got Republicans to vote for it. You can't offshore this, it has to be done locally. And you build new skills, and you get people thinking in an integrated way. And that changes the, the conversation. LF USA, you can look at the numbers. 98 cents a square foot, 134,000 energy savings over the term, 566. Annual rate of return, 27%, three and a half year payback. The other thing which is really important, measurement verification. So this is 2017 because we just finished 2018. And 2017, uh, we do M&V. 2017's numbers were done about October of 18. And this shows you the actual savings that we received and how they were broken out. Where they, where they lay in the eight measures we integrated together. So our target for 2017, put it another way, our projection in 2007 was $4.8 million of savings. Over the period of time, we developed a target for 2017 of 5.3 million. Our actual savings uh, for the Empire State Building, 2017 was $6.6 .6 million. Yes? Uh, this is in the energy cost. This is the cost at the time. So in, in, so in 2007, that was what we estimated the cost to be. For the 2017 target savings, it be basically most of our, our, our electricity is contracted for 20, you know, 18 to 24 months in advance. And, and 2017 is the actual savings. So the, so the interesting thing about this is it's, it's real dollars. What's another interesting thing about it? When we were doing the Empire State Building, one of the things we thought, we're going to air condition the hallways, they're never air conditioned. We're going to have more modern tenants, greater density. You know, LinkedIn is now is 325,000 square feet in the Empire State Building. Very dense, shutter stock, 75,000 square feet, very dense. HNT, a big, en big engineering firm, has 125,000, very dense. So we thought to ourselves, we, you know, we actually had a budget to spend $20 million just to bring in new vaults from Con Ed in the sidewalk 
to bring in more power to the building. We had another $25 million of switchgear, another $25 million of vertical distribution of power within the building. And we were going to have to replace our chiller system. By making the envelope of the building more efficient, which requires less heating and cooling, we were able to increase the efficiency of our existing system, not increase our power supply to the building at all, and air condition the hallways, and increase the density in the building. We have 16,500 daily workers in the Empire State Building. A few thousand visitors come in and out. We could have 25,000 people in a day going in and out of the observatory. But the office users, and there are other neat things we've done, elevators. Uh, we have the Otis uh, Regen Compass Destination Dispatch System in the building, 68 elevators. We have three left to finish replacing. As they go down, it's like a hybrid. They spool up electricity. But instead of going into a battery, they have power elevators that are going up at the same time. You know, all kinds of different things you can do. Uh, I will get to the wrap up here. So again, this is from our contract savings, what we received. So Johnson Controls gave us an energy savings contract, a performance contract. The first slide I showed you is what we did save. This is against the savings that they actually promised us. And again, the contract savings were, were here, and, and that's what we actually achieved. Um, so, since we started, it was getting built out in 2010, it's been phased in over time as we redevelop tennis spaces. We have saved $23 million against a target of $19 million. And, um, I think it's, we got two more slides here. This one is very interesting to me because what it does is it shows uh, our, our, our heating degree days, our cooling degree days, and our, our, our utility costs, and how it all plays together. But if you take a look what's happened since 2007 to 2018, the building is more occupied with greater density. We air condition the spaces that, that are common areas of the building. We weren't air conditioned before. We have a 15 and a half thousand square foot tenants only fitness center. We've got all kinds of things going on in there. We're consuming less energy. Uh, some people may be familiar with uh, the, the, the energy unit intensity. Empire State Building, 81. Average office, uh, median, excuse me, office building in New York City, 172. We, are, we consume half as much power, or our energy unit intensity is uh, less than 50% of the median building. Uh, last thing, I think it's very important that when we talk about uh, green versus energy optimization, green is the softer stuff, all right? And you like to think that you can accomplish all these things at no additional cost. But some of the sustainability metrics for which you get credit from the U.S. Green Building Council for LEED don't do anything. Bicycle racks, showers, water features, plant walls, employee engagement, carbon disclosure. When you, when you look at all of these different things, preferred parking for low emissions vehicles, you get LEED for doing things like this. It doesn't do a freaking thing. It doesn't advance the ball. And those are rich people's options. Energy optimization you can do regardless of the rent because you're paying for it through energy savings. And energy costs the same whether you're paying $12 a square foot for rent in, in, a, in a market, $12 a square foot for rent, or you're paying $100 a square foot for rent. Kilowatt hour trades more commonly in the world than the Big Mac. And uh, with that, I'm done. Those are the uh, partners. Now, if you notice, lower right-hand corner, after uh, our IPO, uh, which was actually a, a giant secondary, we really didn't raise, we raised $125 million in new money and sold 
uh, close to a billion dollars of, of uh, the, the Helmsley estate's interest after she had died. They then made a gift of a million dollars towards the tenant energy optimization program because they understood what we had done through the work, which increased the value of the Empire State Building, increased their value when they cashed out. So, uh, anyhow, that's it. I, I, I'm, I'm prepared to move on. Or Tony cannot stay for the q and I don't know if you want to have a few questions right now. Yeah, so I, 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 I'm on fumes right now. I'm going to go uh, home and lie down. But, uh, <laughs> but if you have a question, please do it. If not, I've got a very packed day today with a lot of interesting folks. So it's really exciting to see everybody engaged. It's great to see the folks from uh, Newmark and the folks from Absolute <laughs> participating in this. You know, think about this. Anybody in the real estate business, go on to the Tenant Energy Optimization Program for uh, the Urban Land Institute. There are materials in there to educate targeted towards individual skill sets, brokers, engineers, architects, property managers, property owners. So, so you, there, there's actual curriculum in there. And the TIOP is actually the how-to to get uh, Energy Star for tenants. So anybody have a question on the website? Thank you very much. Yes. Slide. Sure. Early, early has the slides. So the answer is yes. By the way, you, you, the fonts are a little goofy. Uh, so if you don't have the fonts, they'll, they'll, the, the headings will look funny, but you'll have the slides. Yes. Does the uh, energy star for tenants apply to um, the buildings as well? Not yet. So the, the next one which, uh, the, on which the EPA is working, and uh, so I run the Sustainability Policy Advisory Committee of the Real Estate Roundtable, which is the I chair that, that's the, the lobbying industry, the lobbying for the real estate industry in DC. Uh, Prologis is one of the reps on that committee. And so Prologis is an industrial warehouse distribution business, and they are taking the initiative to try uh, to, to start the work to do a, uh, a certification for a warehouse industrial. Retail would logically be next. Residential is very tough. If you live in a two bedroom, two bath apartment uh, with uh, a wife and, and two kids, uh, you're going to have a completely different consumption profile than the retired 75-year-old couple who lives upstairs in the exact same unit. It, it, that, that's, that's, you know, I, I like to think, how do you eat the elephant? You know, soft tissue first, you know? And, and that's tusks and bones. Anybody else? Yes? Well, energy unit intensity, but yes. So, you know, when you look at it, the numbers aren't big. The investment's not big. The savings are very large relative to the investment. But it's not going to be the, diff the differentiator. Anything that we do, you, you cannot lease one of our buildings without building out your space to what is now uh, TIOP or the Energy Star for Tenants metrics. We, we, won't, we won't allow it. It's in the lease. And we've been able to prove that if you do this, it'll cost you less. You know, after rent, and, and, and you know, payroll, rent, and energy, those are the top three uh, um, costs of, uh, of, of occupancy. But it, it doesn't make it by itself. Yes? I've been being involved with the uh, buildings of your size and residential. Whenever I'm trying to tell people this ends of return, I don't know where the earplugs come in, but it's like the eyes glaze out. Don't, don't, don't tell them, show them. This is, this is what we did with our tenants. Yeah, we, we sat there with, uh, I remember global, uh, LFUSA, which is now Global Brands Group, and, and uh, uh, very forward-looking uh, folks who control that company, the Fung family from Hong Kong. And they were there with their architects and with Arup and their, their contractors. And we said, this is what you, we, we want you to do. And Arup said, oh, that, you know, that won't work. It's very expensive. Arup's a very big engineering firm. So we said, you don't have to do anything which doesn't give you a five-year return, a five-year payback, or better. We won't obligate you to do anything. And then I said, so, 
you know, to the person from Europe, please explain which of these in concert make this not a five return, a five year return or better. So we did the math. And take a look at it on, on, on all of our, our materials. You gotta show the numbers. The, the conversation their eyes glaze over because they don't get it. Yes? How much of that uh, difference in the energy use unit that you referenced has to do with that the Empire State Building is all masonry wall versus you know, 1967 construction? So, so HVAC is a, is, is a big load. And, uh, and, and so the answer is, well, uh, that's a lot. Um, you know, if you have a, a 1960s, 70s, even 80s curtain wall glass building, you have a, it's, it's a much bigger challenge. You can still do lighting controls. You can still do plug load controls. You can still have a better integrated system, but your load is, is, is going to be higher. But on a relative basis, this is the thing. We shouldn't be holding every building to an absolute number. We should be looking for buildings on a percentage basis to improve. So if you have an energy pig that's never going to get Energy Star, but you improve its efficiency by 40%, that's a huge contribution. One, one, one last question, because I know you've got a, a, a very big program here. Or, yes? Uh, Tony, how did it affect your occupancy? Well, I, I, it affected our occupancy, but uh, you make a good point. It was an awful lot of it was about branding. All right, so we wanted to differentiate ourselves from everybody else out there. The Empire State Building in August of 2006 had 752 individual suites. The average in-place fully escalated rent was $26.50 a foot. Basically break even. So, um, yeah, we don't lease in the building now anything that doesn't begin with a seven. You know, in, in, the, in the first year. Uh, and much better tenants, I mean, you know. The Empire State Building is a highly desirable place. And, and, the, and the employees, the workers, who help drive tenant decision-making, love it. Uh, J.C. Deco uh, has their North American headquarters on two floors, smashing offices in the 73rd and 74th floors. Jean-Francois Deco came over for a, a tour on a Saturday on his way back to London from some uh, conference. So I went and did the tour myself. He didn't want to hear about it. He wanted them to move to one uh, World Trade Center or Hudson Yards. Uh, but then his, his people overwhelmed his decision making and he, now he looks at it and he says, you know, this is, anyone who knows Jean-Francois, he's a pretty curmudgeonly guy. And he'll say this was, the, this was the right choice. So the iconic nature of it was always superior to the interior. Now the interior matches the iconic status of the building. Anyhow, thank you so much. Thanks. For your Uh, thank you, Tony. I'm sure there were many things to remember, especially the uh, flying monkeys. That was especially good uh, comment. So the next speaker is uh, Bruce Becker. Um, he's involved with integrated green development, planning, preservation, and architecture. Uh, his firm is in, in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut, and New York City. So uh, are this, is the uh, overhead ready? Yep. Good. Okay. Thank you. That was very impressive to see Tony's talk, um, and also that the Empire State Building, which is one of the most iconic buildings in the world, can be a flagship for energy efficiency and sustainability. I think it's really important when you have high-profile projects as an opportunity to demonstrate and be a leader for um, for the uh, real estate community and the design community. So. Um, and I, I've sort of had a similar, felt an obligation myself because I've been involved in some large, some large buildings in Connecticut as well as in New York City. And what I was going to do is talk about um, some case studies along the same lines as, as Tony's discussion, um, but also looking at multifamily and mixed use development. Um, it, uh, uh, very simple. So uh, just to continue the introduction, my, my company is Becker & Becker Associates, um, started by my father in 1950 and as an industrial design firm, but I've been running it as an architecture and development firm uh, since 1988. Um, my client, my, one of my early clients, Sam Fuller, is in the front row, which I was glad to reconnect with. Um, we started out doing 
conventional architectural work for developers and then joined the development game ourselves. And actually having the uh, ability to be your own client, similar to an architect designing his own house, gives you the chance to really push the envelope in terms of sustainability. Often you'll have, as I'm sure you know, you may have a client that's interested in sustainability, but the engineer or architect doesn't have the experience or vice versa. Uh, but because we're the architect and the developer, we really have no excuse. We have to do it, and um, it's actually given us a lot more uh, flexibility and freedom. Uh, I'm actually very optimistic having uh, seen trends in um, the development world as well as uh, other things related to energy that we're turning the corner and, and uh, we'll be able to, maybe not quite as fast as we should, but we're going to. Uh, we're going to be making progress in reducing our carbon footprint. The technology is there to do it now. Um, a lot of it is just getting the word out, and having a forum like this is, is certainly key to do that. So I commend the Greenwich Energy Committee and uh, C. Paul and others that organize this. Uh, am I supposed to point? Oh, here we go. Yeah, so this. I'm not sure if this is still the largest apartment building in Connecticut, but this is a 500 unit, 32 um, story tower that we developed in New Haven on, at the corner of Chapel and State Street. It's a LEED Platinum building, um, and it uses about 50% of the energy of a new code compliant building. It's powered with a uh, fuel cell, um, which provides almost all of its uh, heating uh, and power. Uh, to, uh, well, it uses natural gas, it's reformed to hydrogen. It um, doesn't have any particular pollution, and it does have a significant reduction in carbon impact. But it's also a nice place to live. This is where we did our, we had done a project uh, called the Octagon on Roosevelt Island, a 500 unit development there, which is lead silver. Uh, but this is the first place that we put a fuel cell and really thought in an integrated way about uh, sustainability. And this is a modification of a chart that Jonathan Rose first produced. We added another bar on the right here for 360 State Street, showing that uh, when we think about buildings and energy impacts, actually the location and the type of the building has as big an impact as anything because of the transportation impact. If you build a house out in the countryside that you're, where you're car dependent, uh, particularly if that car is not an electric car, um, you're you're actually using more uh, energy and having a bigger carbon impact um, uh, from the transportation impact of that location than even the building itself. So as you, as you evolve to a denser building type and you become more urban, you can actually reduce your carbon footprint from the norm. And 360 State Street at the time was sort of the, the new frontier because we were able to, to come up with an energy model that put us at 19% of the sort of typical housing in Connecticut. This is a picture of me in front of the fuel cell at 360 State Street. Um, it's a 400 kW fuel cell, and uh, it reduces 99.8% of the particulate pollution. And uh, of course, when you're reducing your energy costs and using combined heat and water, uh, uh, heat and, and uh, hot water for uh, combined heat and power, you, uh, you're also saving money. Um, this looks at the uh, carbon uh, or the particular pollution savings when we're going to a fuel cell, which I'm a big advocate of. Um, and then a more recent project is 777 Main Street in Hartford. We actually, uh, like the Empire State Building, we recycled the whole building. And I think that is sometimes uh, not fully understood how important it is to recycle buildings. Um, and I do think that historic preservation and sustainability go hand in hand. And um, I think I've been able to demonstrate that you can, you can make an older building just as green as a new building and at a fraction of the cost. So this was a, a mid-century modern building designed by Wilma Beckett in 1967. Uh, it was vacant in downtown Hartford, and it's now the largest apartment building in Hartford with 285 apartments. 
Uh, we gutted the office floors and uh, put in a double loaded corridor and have about 13 apartments on each floor uh, with studios, once and two bedrooms. They sort of look like um, this with amazing views. And, and the market demand in Connecticut cities is insatiable. Um, all the buildings that are coming on the market get filled up instantly. But this one is the, uh, this is the only lead platinum one. I'm a little discouraged that more people aren't following in our footsteps to make super green buildings. I think it may just be a function of the design teams are divided and maybe there's still some skepticism about the economics, but <coughs> definitely these projects work because they make them sustainable. We couldn't make the budgets work if we spent more money on energy. And it really doesn't cost us more than one or two percent more than our whole budget to, to do these deep energy retrofits. I'm just giving you some pictures to see what the units look like. They're, um, they're small, very energy efficient. We took over some of the common spaces and uh, they're used for co-working and for the, um, this diverse group of professionals that have come to the downtown. This is the old boardroom for the Hartford National Bank that's now a gym. Uh, and the, we have this vast basement that we have uh, yoga studios and other um, recreational uses. And we brought in uh, Blue State Coffee to uh, the ground floor, which is very popular. Uh, these are some of the views from the top. And here we put our fuel cell out on, uh, behind the building in the driveway. Uh, the same Doosan 400 kilowatt fuel cell. Uh, it saves us about a dollar a square foot in operating costs. Uh, we've been able to, uh, the subsidies for these fuel cells has changed. New York State, NYSERDA gave us a, about a million dollar grant uh, for our fuel cell. We did a retrofit of the Octagon with one. In Connecticut, we've worked uh, uh, with the Green Bank for uh, CPACE funding. And we also worked with the uh, utilities with an LREC uh, contract that was sort of a reverse auction. Uh, so the subsidies change. Uh, in all these cases, we've had a 30% tax credit, a federal tax credit on the fuel cell, which has helped us. Um, it's interesting, the economics work without the subsidies, um, but it's almost, with the subsidies, it's impossible not, if you understand it fully, it's impossible not to, it's almost irresponsible not to, not to incorporate these technologies. Uh, here we have the fuel cell in position. We also have 28 electric car charging stations at 777 Main. You know, this helps address the other part of the equation in Connecticut. It's actually the transportation sector that is the biggest problem in terms of fossil fuel emissions and carbon emissions. Um, the grid is getting greener. Um, Sam told me he wanted to test the Model 3. The fact that this guy here, who, who well, this guy who, you know, his natural state was to buy a Chevy Suburban, and uh, the fact that uh, there's actually was an 80% increase in plug-in cars in Connecticut in the last year, 80%. And uh, if you look at the trend, by 20, 28, half the cars in Connecticut will be electric, if that trend continues, uh, which is uh, very hopeful. Um, the fact that we can't buy a Tesla in Connecticut is a, another issue. Hopefully that will be solved by the legislature. Last year, a thousand people had to go out of state to buy their electric car. But anyhow, we, we produce clean energy to power uh, the various electric car stations at 777. It's also an amenity. Uh, we put a 115 kW solar array on top of the building. This actually might be the tallest um, array in Connecticut. Uh, this is a picture I took with my drone, which was fun. But it's, you know, this is not the most economical solar array to put in to, to install because we had to engineer a racking system that was almost as expensive as the panel. But even with that, it's like a five-year payback. So I'm a big fan of solar, it's the cleanest system. <coughs> Obviously, for a tall building, you can't produce uh, more than a fraction of your energy needs. But if you combine clean energy 
with an electric, primarily electric HVAC system, you can really uh, reduce your carbon footprint in a major way. So I want to go back to this slide here. Yeah. So this, um, I'm happy to share these slides as well. Uh, this is sort of a indication of where we were relative to the baseline. You can see our savings with various technologies. It didn't cost much more to integrate, but they went beyond the baseline code compliant design of a savings of um, about $135,000 uh, in natural gas and $108,000 in, in electricity, uh, which gave us a 28% savings, 28% return, I'm sorry, 28% reduction in our energy costs. Yeah, when you reduce your energy costs by 28%, that starts to be serious money. I would agree with Tony that you can't necessarily use this as a strategy to buy a building and add tons of value, but you can uh, certainly enhance your return. And in some, you know, I think anyone who owns a building, if they look at this, they can, uh, they might be able to improve their NOI significantly. Uh, this is just an overview of, of the issues when you have on-site energy production. I guess this is, I'm not sure this is something that uh, you see in too many buildings, even the Empire State Building, but I've, I'm a big believer in making the electricity on-site. Uh, it simplifies the process of, um, you know, when you, you have transmission losses, when you're pulling all your power from the grid, and the more we can sort of decentralize our uh, energy sources, the more resilient it can be. But this is the, the problem with solar is that you have a, a production in the middle of the day. Now for some uses that works, but in most cases, unless you tie that with batteries, which you can do, um, it doesn't really match your loads. Um, and this is uh, also the, the uh, daily variation based on how cloudy it is. But you can produce this energy from solar, you have that, that, and you have that inconsistency with fuel cells. Uh, it runs 24/7, and other than times uh, when it's serviced, uh, you get a continuous output. So we like to marry those and sort of look at our our overall demands for electricity and try to match them up. Yeah, uh, I'm, well, I'm finished. Okay, I'm going to just very quickly flip through these. I do have all of the, the paybacks that show that with um, subsidies, it's a two and a half year payback. Without subsidies, 5.8. And uh, for those that are interested, this is a list of all of our green building features that we've tried to incorporate. They, they did get us to leave platinum. And I also have a case study for my own house. I'm just going to flip through these very quickly because I realize I'm almost out of time here. This is my house in Westport, which um, I took the oil furnace out and I put in uh, variable refrigerant flow heat pumps. So I have no fossil fuels on site. I foamed my roof. I uh, put a, a highly reflective uh, asphalt shingle on the house. And this, now, this house now produces pretty much all the energy just from the solar and the battery storage uh, that it needs on an annual basis. So you can see my roof discreetly has uh, two different arrays that um, over the course of the year produce enough power to heat and cool and power the plug loads for the house as well as uh, provide the power for two electric cars. So you can live in, in Connecticut. I, was, I, I heard that the genesis for the Energy Committee was to try to deal with the impact of a substation that was going in here to see if um, the demands for power in Greenwich could be reduced. And I was talking with a gentleman earlier on the committee who was just assuming that energy demand has to go up. It's inevitable, but I don't think it has to. Uh, just as the number of uh, internal combustion engine cars went down last year, I think our, we sort of hit the peak electric demand moment. And even with electric cars coming online, they can be powered uh, at times when there's lesser demand. So 
Those are my power walls, and I can talk to you for hours about electric cars. But this is one thing here about, we did a HERS rating for my house after the retrofit. And before the retrofit, it had a 253 rating. A standard new home is 100. My HERS rating is 19 after this retrofit. That's a 25% of the energy use that I used to have relative to. And then um, I can, I'm happy to share my return on investment, which was 22% uh, on the money, $60,000 I invested in my house. That is all really amazing. See what can be done if we just work at it. Uh, the next speaker is Anthony Clark. studies this morning for people who have made deep, comprehensive retrofits in their buildings. Many customers might do one thing or two things. These, you know, these guys have done uh, 20 or 30 things in their building, which is incredible. For decades, Connecticut has supported the implementation of efficiency with the energy efficiency programs run by the utilities. Uh, Eversource for 149 of the towns and UI on the electric side for 20 of the towns. They've been nationally award, uh, rec nationally recognized programs for 20 years. They're here to help you however you choose to take advantage of them. There are rebates at the point of sale. There are rebates for energy modeling for new construction projects. There are uh, rebates for lighting and individual measures. That's my top level speech, but I'm gonna uh, accelerate through uh, some things that are more interesting and give time for Anthony to talk about the financial piece. What are other customers doing? Where are the savings coming from in Connecticut? About 65% of our savings last year came from lighting improvements. LEDs are on a very steep, rapid adoption curve. Many LED projects coming uh, to us. On the gas side, it's primarily heating. We do get a lot on the manufacturing side from process improvements where we can help manufacturers improve their individual processes. We're really working on uh, having the programs promote best-in-class lighting technologies and promote comprehensive uh, projects where more than one end use is taken up lighting and heating, or lighting and heating and cooling, preferably. And the incentives are correspondingly higher depending on how many different end uses you do take on. We uh, try to tailor all the program solutions to individual market segments. For small businesses, we can deploy turnkey pre-approved contractors that use fixed pricing, doesn't matter which one you use, come in, uh, do the audit, make a proposal for you, implement the changes, administer the cost of it on, on your bill, uh, cash flow neutral usually uh, over four years at zero percent. Incredibly easy to take advantage of. We can also uh, you know, work with our uh, more advanced contractors to do some of these more customized deep retrofits. Let me just touch on lighting a little bit. This is a, a recent study on the penetration of LEDs. Uh, we're over here at the left, 2019 now. We're on the steep part of the curve. This technology has changed dramatically, is improving, and is rapidly being deployed in buildings because it's such a clear winner uh, in energy savings. And along with it comes the use of advanced controls, uh, whether they're networked, uh, like the Empire State Building, uh, with wireless network controls, or hardwired, but taking advantage of opportunities to dim when there's daylight coming in from the windows, aggressively uh, responding to the occupancy use to shut down when people aren't using the space, uh, and even trimming the total uh, uh, power output of the fixtures. Most fixtures can be run at 70 to 80% of their maximum output. 
without any noticeable difference to the tenant's uh, customer of uh, the output of the light. It extends the life of the fixture and further uh, reduces the energy consumed. So LEDs, if you haven't thought of them yet, um, that technology is here and ready to roll. I'll skip through that. Uh, these slides will be available too. That just kind of where those savings occur, uh, mostly interior, uh, also exterior. <laughs> the lighting can also be a, a powered platform in your building for other types of controls, inventory management. Warehouses have lighting that are uh, tracking the movement of forklifts up and down the aisles and helping the customer better uh, optimize the layout uh, of the warehouse. Uh, this is really, uh, you know, 21st century big data uh, stuff that the lighting, your lighting is talking to and providing to him. And that increases the, you know, the economic payback to you beyond the energy savings. So we do um, incentivize lighting and we incentivize better lighting systems more. So going to the level of the Empire State Building, those network lighting controls would get the top tier incentive. Just uh, a very simple uh, lighting LED tube replacement without any controls would get much less. And the difference would be it might cover up to 65% of the cost at the highest level and down to 25% of the cost at the lowest level. So right. there could be a difference. And it, most customers are trying to hit that middle level where they take advantage of the sensor. Lots of gas measures. We're not the gas company here in Greenwich. We are in Stanford. I know there's a mix, but our, our programs work very similarly across all the utilities in Connecticut. We've got support for any new equipment. If you're doing new construction or buying a new piece of equipment, please talk to your utility about getting an incentive to buy the most efficient version. It usually covers between 75 and 95% of that incremental cost, and you're left with a piece of equipment that has a you know, much more efficient operating profile for you. Uh, it's, a, it's an absolute clear win, and, and you really should bring all those projects to us. Uh, building controls. It was mentioned that demand control ventilation uh, Making sure that we're not overly uh, conditioning outside air for the spaces. This is a really good measure in schools and other buildings that have large public spaces. Picture a gymnasium in a high school. The ventilation system is built to provide sufficient ventilation when there's 1,500 people in there for the big basketball game. The reality is most schools, you know, there's 18 kids in there doing something during gym class. There's no reason to be ventilating and conditioning outside air, dehumidifying it, heating, cooling it as needed during the year to uh, at the same level for that level of occupancy. So implementing controls that can reduce uh, the amount of outside air that's provided and reduce the conditioning is a very clear winner and something we're trying to wrap up, uh, ramp up a penetration of. I don't think there's a whole lot of industrial customers in the room, but there's lots of opportunities in the industrial space. Uh, heat recovery from air compressors and dust collectors are very uh, effective. Uh, we see really creative, uh, efficient you know, furnaces uh, and variable speed controls. Uh, so there's just some really advanced thinking going into all of these processes from manufacturing, which makes them more competitive on the global stage, which obviously is critical for us. And then last, before I turn it over to Anthony, uh, the comprehensive approach. Addressing multiple end uses will get you to that 65% incentive level, which is, uh, for other than new construction, uh, kind of where we uh, top out. Uh, so again, addressing heating and cooling at the same time, or lighting and heating at the same time, uh, refrigeration. Any combination of those measures drives you up to those higher incentive levels, something you can explore. I'm going to close and turn it over to you quickly, Anthony, but um, I have to run right at 10 o'clock. Jose Colon is here in the building, and Ron Arujo is here from our team at Eversource. They'll be here for more of the networking. Very easy to reach us uh, through the Energize CT website, and we look forward to working with you. We do about 6,000 commercial sector uh, projects a year, and another probably 100,000 that just get a discount at the point of sale at their distributor. Uh, so we're very, very active and ready to work with you on, on whatever your need is. Great. So I'm Anthony Clark with the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, frankly, there could be no better introduction than the Empire State Building story and then what Bruce has been able to accomplish in Connecticut to make the case for these projects. So I can be very brief in explaining that the Green Bank is essentially designed in Connecticut and here to enable you to make upgrades that are clean energy related to your buildings or to help uh, finance higher performance new buildings. So 
I will go through um, very simple case study. Curtis Manufacturing, or uh, Curtis Packaging is a manufacturer. Uh, they are in the Newtown area. This is a company that was trying to decide between investing in uh, the printing presses and other equipment that they needed for their core business uh, in addition to trying to make energy upgrades. The Green Bank essentially provided the financing so that they could have uh, essentially nothing out of pocket and do a really significant comprehensive upgrade. So you're looking at uh, switching from oil to natural gas, uh, doing comprehensive lighting controls, HVAC upgrades, and also doing solar. So just in the big picture, a $3 million project, um, you know, a meaningful chunk coming from the utilities in, in the form of an incentive, um, ZREC uh, funding, which is essentially money that you can get for the utility purchasing the RECs from a solar system, but that left a significant unfunded uh, need, which the Green Bank filled uh, with financing for them. So this is a very good example of the kind of thing that we do for customers in Connecticut. This was done through CPAY's financing. I'm not going to dive into the minutia on that. It's the same program that Bruce was able to take advantage of to finance uh, the fuel cell at some of his properties. It is essentially custom made fixed interest financing that you can get for long terms, reasonable interest rates. And the key distinction is that it is actually tied to the property. So it's not financing that you as an individual, uh, a business owner, or even your business would take on as an obligation. It actually stays tied to the property, similar to a uh, sewer or water assessment. The idea is you're improving the building, it's providing a public benefit by reducing energy consumption or generating cleaning at clean energy, and therefore you get the benefit of financing those upgrades in a way that stays tied to the property. So as long as you are occupying it or owning it, you'll repay the financing on your property tax bill, it's a separate line item, and when you sell the property, it can transfer with the sale. Um, so it's, it's, again, completely designed to help you make upgrades that may be longer payback, larger dollar amounts, um, and to make it easier to say yes to those. This is in a slide that you will get what CBASE is. You can use it for a tremendous number of energy measures, including um, improvements that may have a relation to the clean energy. So for example, many people who use CBASE financing, they start with needing a new roof on their building, and they don't have the, the funding for it. What they're able to do is use some of the value that that solar system is going to create over its lifetime to subsidize the roof replacement. So you can pay for the roof because you need it if you're going to put solar on, bundle them together in a no out of pocket way, and still capture the federal 30% ITC. So it's a great offering. We've done about 250 CPAYS projects in Connecticut, uh, about $134 million of financing. Again, it works for small projects on the large projects, uh, many different types of properties from industrial to nonprofit. Uh, and again, we people use CPAYS financing to do renewables projects, efficiency, and combined. Um, the Green Bank also offers separate financing for solar systems through a power purchase agreement. So that's essentially where uh, the Green Bank would own the system and you uh, as the counterparty would just pay for the electricity that the system produces. I'm gonna, this is another uh, case study which is gonna sit in the slide, so again, I'm not gonna dive too deep, but it's essentially, uh, we had four stone partners do a deep uh, retrofit of a commercial real estate building in Bridgeport. Um, so great local economic development story, um, as well as offer being able to bring a, a space uh, you know, up to a level of performance than an aesthetics, replacing the windows that they really needed to do, and while drastically reducing the out-of-pocket expense. So. I think I won't even bring Andy back up, maybe for this, because we, are, we promised 10 minutes. Um, there are, if you're thinking about developing a high-performance uh, new building or a deep retrofit, there are several ways to do that in Connecticut. The um, utilities have a great incentive program for it, and then the Green Bank also has um, a model or an, a financing offering that will essentially allow you to bring in some of that CPAYS financing into the project. The utilities have incentives to do a whole building energy performance model, so that is, before you ever build the building, you create a virtual model, do an estimate of how much energy will consume, 
use that model to actually adapt and improve your design so that you are not locking in unnecessary energy expenditures over the life of that building, and the Green Bank can help finance those, um, those buildings as well. In new construction projects? Um, yeah, so what we have seen is um, PACE for new construction has gained a huge life outside of Connecticut, and we're just bringing it to Connecticut. And what we are seeing is that in projects, basically the, the CPACE can displace sponsor equity. So it, it depends on the project, it depends on who your other partners are in the project, but that is one of the key draws for, uh, for, for many developers. Either they want to displace higher cost capital in their project, and I can go back to that. Um, so one example on the left would be, center is your, your base capital stack, the baseline condition on the left. Maybe you're trying to displace some more expensive capital, you bring CPACE in. Um, sometimes projects may overrun their budget, so you, often, so you're looking for a little bit more money uh, and CPAs can play in there. I am happy to take questions, chat afterward for anyone who wants to dive more deeply into how that fits. A quick question for both of you. The uh, legislature <clears throat> effectively stole or moved about $120 or $30 million out of your programs collectively. And of course, the state is in a pretty bad fiscal shape. I assume that has an impact on your programs as a whole. But maybe you could just comment on it from a factual point of view. Uh, sure. Um, that raid, uh, as of July this year, we go back to the original budgets. It did have some implications on the Eversource side. We had an alternative financing mechanism that was able to fill some of that gap. We did have to trim some of our programs that uh, weren't solely focused, uh, well, the, the initiative was to trim the programs that weren't solely focused on delivering energy savings, some of our education programs, so forth. They indirectly bring us projects, but we, you know, we did have to trim some programs and, and uh, revise, we survived it, uh, we kept going, um, and didn't affect our gas budgets, and we're back on track this year. And if you have a question about, so CPACE, fortunately, part of the model of the Green Bank is to create products and then help them to move into a situation which in which they're sustainable with private financing. So the vast majority of CPACE financing in Connecticut, the actual capital for the loan is coming from private investors. So fortunately, we, although the Green Bank's budget was cut in half, essentially for two years, we didn't have to drastically scale back C-based lending. So the idea is to put products out into the market that can sustain some of this turbulence, and C-base is one of them. Okay, that's really great. We can talk about this stuff all day, and, and I'm sorry to say we're behind schedule. The next part of the uh, program includes a, a panel discussion. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Ron Arugio, who, who has a similar job to uh, Andrew Bridges. I don't know if you, Andrew, Anthony are going to hang around here. And we're going to add Rich Granoff to the panel. Rich, as you know, is the leading architect in Greenwich. Uh, he just did a great job on 330 Railroad Avenue, converting an industrial building to a very modern, desirable commercial office space, and excels in landscape architecture, uh, residential, commercial, and, and he is just growing like crazy in, in his jobs and staff. So we can all gather here if you want, and then uh, you can fire off more questions, um, uh, and we'll just try to get that started. Uh, the question and answer is supposed to last about 15 minutes, and there's a half an hour allotted for the tour of this building. So does everybody want to come up and sit down here? Yep. And Bruce, you're coming back. Here's Ron. All right, any more questions? Okay, it's all over. Okay, good. No? Yes? Yeah, I, I do have a question. That sort of builds on what Bruce was talking about, about EV and EV accessibility and charging stations. Um, for 
significant retrofits or new construction, one of the things that we're trying to move from a point of view of state uh, building codes is just to provide a conduit to a public space uh, so that in the future there can be an EV charging station there. I mean, the little bit of construction I've done is, you know, sort of wisdom in getting conduit built when uh, everything's opened up and the project is, is underway and you can build it into the electrical system. So I just want to get a sense from you whether that makes sense, A, and B. Are there other alternative ways to incentivize that outside of uh, a building code change, which takes years to take, years to occur, et cetera? So. Is that um, directed to me or Any, anyone? Yeah. anyone? Well, I'll, I'll chime in. You know, the, the, the new code does actually require one outlet in every garage for, for the new building code that's just been adopted. Uh, but it doesn't require 220 or level 2 charging. And there's, it doesn't address commercial buildings or, or multifamily buildings. So I think uh, my feeling is there is a need for a code amendment. Uh, it would be interesting if uh, there also was a, I think the utilities, will find that electric vehicles are the best way for them to grow their sales without having an environmental, creating environmental problems because they can sell the electricity off peak when it's essentially free and reduce everyone's electric costs. I think there was a study that showed it would save all electric consumers um, hundreds of millions of dollars over time. And maybe there could be an incentive from the utilities, or I know in, in um, other states uh, there are subsidies to help builders front that cost. But I, I agree it's something that will help with adoption. Um, and uh, what I can do is I can add from the utility perspective a couple of things. One is, is that on the single family side, we do offer incentives for high efficiency new construction. And to receive the highest tier, we require that the home be not only solar PV ready, so to address your point that the conduit and the uh, uh, breaker panel uh, components are already in place, but we also have a similar uh, thing that we kicked off for 2019 that now requires the home to be uh, EV ready, if you will, and is an additional incentive. And we also have an additional incentive for someone who uh, builds a new construction dwelling that's all electric using high efficiency heat pumps and a, a good thermal envelope. Does that incentive apply to the significant retrofits for existing buildings? It, it would apply to what we would call a major renovation because we would want to see a significant um, influence on the thermal structure of the thermal envelope as well as the equipment going in, but yes. And how about on the commercial side? On the, commer on the commercial side, we're still looking at uh, you know, how we're going to deploy um, EV infrastructure. That is something that we're still uh, looking at. Um, Andy, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to that. Yeah, I mean, we have an active EV team. There's been more going on in Massachusetts and in other states that I'm sure a model will emerge in Connecticut. I'm not on that team, so I'm not going to speak for them, but it's under active discussion for what role the utilities can play to help develop that. DEEP had done some early work uh, developing charging stations across the state to you know, sort of battle concerns about uh, driving limits and so forth. They've moved on to incentivizing the vehicles themselves, and I think you know moving towards uh, a model for incentivizing the chargers, uh, whatever that may be. But it's coming. Uh, yeah, I've been a strong proponent of EVs for uh, the five years that I've owned my Tesla, and I've, I think I've influenced a lot of my friends and clients to uh, to purchase EVs. Uh, that combined with solar, uh, rooftop solar, which I've also as an architect. Part of educating all of my clients on uh, uh, clean energy. I'm actually designing a new home for myself right now, and I'm using solar uh, and a ground source heat pump uh, system, which is really a no-brainer for new construction in, in residential. And I've completed over 25 projects um, very successfully uh, for my clients. So I, I think it starts there, um, as well as uh, LED lighting is also a kind of low-hanging fruit. We, we never use incandescent lighting ever. <laughs> and, 
anymore, other than a table lamp, and even those had retrofit um, bulbs. Um, but to your original question about infrastructure in, in, in parking lots, um, we're running conduits anyway for, um, for light poles, so it's pretty easy to get uh, the infrastructure uh, in place based on that. Another successful uh, application that I've done in parking lots is solar arrays to use for shading cars which is really kind of a, a double duty, uh, uh, lower the, the, heat, the heating load on the cars, protect them, and generate uh, 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 power that way. Well, I'm hearing you all agree that it makes sense to do it when the project is being created. Absolutely. Yeah, well, the architectural community is, is really a, a big part of educating uh, our clients. We're, we're, the, we're the front line uh, in that respect. Uh, I spend a lot of time early on in projects trying to educate clients, and I think the, the slides that were shown here today are, are really good, and I can't wait to get my hands on them, because the eyes glazing over, as you said, uh, happens a lot. And ultimately, many times when I try to educate clients on energy efficiency in their projects, it starts with, you know, what's the return on investment? That really becomes the issue straight on. And, you know, what I explain is sometimes it's a three year, sometimes it's a five year, sometimes it's seven year, depending on what the, what item it is and what the, sub, uh, what the uh, government subsidies are. But ultimately, I, I use the analogy of a, um, a hybrid car that, you know, you feel good about it and this is the right thing to do. And if you're a long-term holder on a commercial building, the payback's there. Um, but the examples that were put up on the board today, I think, are really good um, data for me to break out and say, look, the Empire State Building was a three-year payback. So I'm, I'm excited about that. Maybe I'm, I may be the only other design professional, but I'll tell you, I'm, I'm sort of spoiled because mo I'm, the, I'm the client in most of my projects, but I do have a university project that I'm working on now for a liberal arts college, and we're designing that. Uh, career center for the ground floor of this historic building, their administrative building. And the, there are a lot of people involved, as you can imagine, with any uh, university. Uh, there's deans, there's facilities people, there's construction managers. And we proposed that the air source, VRF air source, air to air heat pump system. And everyone thought, well, no, we can't afford that. We're just going to go with using our central steam system. And I showed them, it actually was the least cost approach. That, that when you, um, the, the most energy efficient systems, in many cases, are the cheapest ones. If you put, if you're, I, I'm still amazed that people are building houses and putting in gas or oil furnaces. Because you can just put in an air to air heat pump, uh, a lot of people in the industry don't realize this, but in the last five years, it, uh, it used to be you'd have to you'd use air heat pumps for cooling, but you'd have to use a different system for heating. Now they work to 25 degrees below zero. They're less expensive. You don't have to worry about, uh, it's an all electric system. Um, and while geothermal is cool, that has a, a longer payback, because it is more expensive. But the air to air, the VRF air to air heat pump systems are the least expensive mechanical system you can buy. And they also are the least expensive to operate, and they don't use any fossil fuels. So um, part of it is just educating folks about it. And I'm, I'm still um, going through this political process with my client, um, but it would, the easy thing would be to have sort of given up. But I'm, I'm, uh, I think if you can show them the information, of course they're not paying you to do this, but I sort of, uh, it's become a hobby of mine is to, to 
show the numbers and the facts. And at the end, it's inevitable. Just like electric cars are inevitable, they are, if you look at the, the life cycle cost of them, they're the cheapest car you can buy. Um, and the same is true for solar and, and air source heat pumps. <coughs> Say it was a commercial condominium or residential? Commercial condominium. Yeah, I, I'm happy to take it. Um, there's incentives for really whatever you choose to do. So <coughs> if, if equipment is being replaced, the incentive is really structured on how much more efficient it is than the current code compliant efficient. And that applies to most uh, boilers, rooftop units, whatever, kind of major capital equipment in a building. Because people don't tend to retrofitted until it's at the end of its life, and probably much of this is. So um, the, the program should cover the incremental cost of that. Other things like lighting, weatherization, uh, insulation, so forth, there are incentives for that based on how much energy it saves. And it, it's usually an engineering calculation on what measures are being proposed, uh, and then it's paid on a dollar per uh, hundred cubic foot for gas or dollar per kilowatt hour basis, uh, the incentive is calculated on. So, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you about it. I'm sure there's a way. Uh, I don't know how far along you are with uh, determining what measures, but we can also provide the lists of active contractors doing that kind of work. So, I'm um, happy to meet you wherever, wherever you are on it. One more. And I'll just add there, uh, we should just talk afterward about what's the right potential green bank product for commercial condo, because it's a little bit of a, a unique bird. So the, this question is for the design professionals. Um, when you're meeting with your private clients, uh, to what extent are you utilizing green charrettes and things of that nature? Oh, that's a good question. Um, when we're trying to educate clients, we typically bring in uh, consultants. Um, which could include a, a MEP engineer and even a, a green consultant. We work with uh, Steve Hall um, on projects as well. And it really needs to be kind of a team effort um, on, on that front. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll uh, encourage folks to, to do energy modeling, uh, particularly if it's a big investment and they want to see that. But I think energy modeling is um, you know, the thing about investing in energy efficiency and sustainability is it's, it's not like putting money in the stock market uh, where you don't really know what your return is. You can actually, if you do a precise energy model, you can know within 1% what your return on investment is. And it's often the best investment you can make. So uh, if we do, where we do rely on outsiders, uh, we will, um, uh, often bring in someone who can do a really detailed energy model uh, to help also evaluate, you know, which, you know, does it really make sense to put in triple glaze windows? Does it make sense to put in additional insulation? How important is a highly reflective roof? But you, if you model that, you can know exactly what your energy budget is going to be uh, if it's a good model. Now, most people who do the modeling don't do it to that level, so we will, you know, for these large buildings, we'll make the investment of $20,000 to model every single thing, and it'll take about 60 days to do. But then we'll, we can take it to the bank, and, you know, the Green Bank can underwrite, um, you know, very precisely with that information. So that's the primary consultant, but also it's important to have MP engineers that um, are comfortable embracing these things, because unfortunately there's a whole spectrum of engineers some just take out a table and they'll specify something that uh, is, you know, provides twice as much capacity as is really necessary. And uh, if you do a precise energy model, rather than putting in a fluff factor and having to put in larger equipment, you can actually 
easily pay for the cost of the model by um, only putting in what you need. You know, we often, if we have a budget problem, we'll go and do that and you know, find out, well, do, do we really need, in these apartments, do we really need you know, a 50 amp panel when we have a 30 amp panel or 20 amp panel? And when we know that precisely, we can some, you know, we'll, we'll take, you know, 10% off our electrical budget. Just to add to that, um, one of the things we look at with our energy efficiency programs is that we do look at the interactive effects of many different types of measures, that, and, and that's where modeling plays a very key role. And, and I, believe, I believe it's true for the Green Bank as well as the utilities. We'll use the energy saving models to help justify and uphold the incentive offering that we can do that would address any of the incremental costs associated with trying to go with a more energy efficient design as you, as you move forward. Okay, well that's, uh, that's it. This has been great. Uh, next time we'll schedule more time. Uh, this, this was sponsored by the Town of Greenwich Conservation Commission and the, the uh, people that did the heavy lifting here are Pat Sesto and Sarah Kakaro. And uh, really, really did the food and the logistics. Uh, there's a lot of food left over here. So uh, that's it. Is, is Jose in the room? Here's Jose. And uh, he can show anybody around the building. But thank you all for your attention. And uh, I know a lot, but I learned a lot more today. And it's been really great. Thank you.